Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Johnny has called from City Airport. Um, uh, Johnny, if Northern Ireland gets this uh, special deal, and Ireland and Northern Ireland get this special deal um, from the EU and the UK, does it have any implication for anyone else in mainland Britain, in your view? Yeah, good afternoon, Sheila. Hello. Well, actually, I phoned up to ask a question. I, I, I was wondering if anyone was really serious about the idea of you and I, for example, having to show our passports to go to Northern Ireland and Scotland. What other part of the world would you have to produce your passport to stay within your own country's borders? Can you imagine travelling from California to Colorado and to show your passport that someone from Canada can just walk straight in? It's absurd. Well, it used to be the case on continental Europe, didn't it? I mean, I, I know there were individual countries, but they were within the same landmass, and you could argue that that's all this is. Well, it's not. It's not at all like that. The borders of the United Kingdom are the borders of the United Kingdom. You can't have borders within the United Kingdom. It would be, for example, like having a border to get in and out of Paris. Yeah, but things are changing. Johnny. What, this madness is what, what, what you're experiencing. What, what we're going through at the moment <laughs> is attempts at every possibility, any idea, it doesn't matter how absurd, how mad, to try and keep us in the European Union. It's, it's beyond madness. Well, in what way? Isn't it just trying to deal with some of the realities thrown up by a, a, a move to leave the European Union? Uh, sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, again? You, you're saying that these are all th moves or questions uh, aimed at keeping us in the European Union. Aren't they yeah. just things which are being thrown up by the fact that we are trying to leave it? Well... No, because we are not trying to leave it. We voted to leave. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We are going to, you know, let's just take that made. as a given. Right, the decision's been made. On that ballot um, paper, we decided to leave based on information given to us by the Conservative government issuing uh, a leaflet that explained clearly that we would be leaving the European Union and the Customs Union. Yeah, yes, I, I accept that. I accept that. Well, are you a bish bash bosh guy, Johnny, when it comes to Brexit? Because it is complicated. It is more complicated than that. And the Irish situation illustrates that perfectly. Well, I'm, I'm, I, dis I disagree. It isn't that complicated. It's being made complicated. There are people putting complications into the arena permanently. Well, go on. Every simplify. Day, simplify. Up, Before we hear from Leo Varadkar, Theresa May and Jean-Claude Juncker, Johnny, simplify the Irish border question. The Irish border question is an Irish border. If they want to put a border up, that's up to the European Union. The United Kingdom doesn't have to install border, border posts. Not necessarily. That's their decision. But it's a separate country. Everything kept get, keeps being batted back into the. But United it's a set. Well, well, because it's a separate country, and when you have a border with a separate country, it is a re, it, it is an issue for both countries. You, you, Johnny, that's just a fact. It's not. A, Ireland isn't a separate country in this incident. It's Ireland European is Union. a separate country. It's part of the European Union, and that's what we're talking about. It's both. The United Kingdom isn't. Well, no. Post Brexit, it won't be. Post Brexit, borders have to go up, then they have to go up. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Johnny in City Airport. Uh, Ireland refuses to accept that those borders should go back up. The DUP, uh, some members privately uh, a year ago on College Green told me they'd be perfectly happy for a wall as high as uh, any wall to go up there. But that's not what the Good Friday Agreement allows for. So it isn't as simple as you're suggesting, Johnny, I'm afraid. Kevin is in Doncaster. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Ian. What a mess we are in. Well, it's difficult to describe this as anything else other than that, isn't it? Because I thought I would be sitting here today saying, well, everything's come together at last. Despite all the difficulties, all the parties have come to some sort of agreement. We can we can argue about the details of it, but there has been an agreement. Instead, uh, the DUP have put a spanner in the works. At least that's how I interpret it. Well, I'd just like to say, if they're listening, these people, Mrs May, Mr Juncker, Mr Tusk, Sadiq Khan, James O'Brien, Jeremy Corbyn, Macron, Mrs Merkel and Owen Jones. We are not Little Greece. We are not Southern Ireland. We are Great Britain. I speak 
myself for the 17.4 million Brits that voted to leave the EU. And I will say this only once. We are leaving the EU. You sounded like that Norwegian football commentator there a bit, didn't you, Kevin? But look, I, I'm with you. I, I think that uh, today, I think, has been a setback. There is no doubt about that. And I think if, if there is any doubt that we are also leaving the single market and the customs union, then I think Theresa May is in a hell of a lot of trouble, political trouble, back at Westminster with many people in her own party who will say, well, sorry, this is not what we signed up for. We've got Nicky Morgan. I've, I've, I've almost forgotten this. Uh, but we've got Nikki Morgan coming in at six o'clock to do a phone-in. Of course, she's an arch Remainer, Kevin. You'd, you'd probably like to have a word with her yourself. Um, I, I think her reaction to this is going to be interesting because it may be that people who voted Remain think this is the beginning of the end of Brexit and uh, Vince Cable will have his way and there will be an exit from Brexit. But you, you clearly don't think so. Well, the thing is, Ian, Mrs May is so weak. We're going to have to have another general election. Um, and... You know, Jacob Rees-Mogg. We're going to have to have him as Prime Minister. He has to be well, the next Prime Minister. Well, let me disappoint you, Kevin, because if there is another general election, Jeremy Corbyn will win it. He won't. No, he won't. Ser seriously, I absolutely believe, and admittedly, my record on predicting general elections, um, shall we say, has been questionable <laughs> over the past, well, certainly in the last one. But I, I don't think there's any doubt that Jeremy Corbyn would at least get the most seats at the moment. When um, when he when the when the whole of the country knows that um, they're going to have the garden tax on the size of the gardens, um, they will not be voting for Jeremy Corbyn. Well, we kind of had that one in, in the last election. Uh, let's get Johnny and Brixton in on this. What do you make of this uh, so-called poverty porn, Johnny? Is that what Ed Sheeran's guilty of? Morning. I'm actually almost physically sick. Um, as a half African, yay, Gambia. Let's go, brothers. Um, right. This is patronising, borderline while I go to the sort of colonial day. And if you ever read my tweets, I might send you a decent one where the president of Ghana recently put Macron in his place, more or less saying we want to be self-sufficient. We don't need handouts. And when I get the, oh, by the way, if you publicise me a, a, enough, can then I raise my profile so I'll help the starving? Yeah. Listen, listen to you celebs that really, really get my goat. It, as I said, it's borderline patronising. Let's help them people over there. Um, how about helping the homeless? I'm around Waterloo at the moment. Some of the homeless. Oh, and by the way, stoom, stop raising your profile. That might, for some of us cynics, mean you got a new record album and you'll be putting it, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> What are you talking about? I've got a new record on you. Oh, I see. I thought you meant me. I'm, yes, I... Yeah. But, but what about the argument that... Hold on. What about the argument that some people weren't even aware of the issues of, let's say, Liberia and street... No, 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 no. Johnny's not buying it. In social media, there is so much information out there. Don't get swayed. And that gentleman on earlier, uh, probably another charity-based tax-exempt one. Well, we don't... He's, they're not here. They're not, they're, they're not anyway. But go, go, just go to the main point, because that's not actually but, um, just... It, I, I really do. It, that's one of the few things, other than your good self, wind me up. But, and, oh, by the way... But you haven't yeah. said how. If, if people become aware of street children in Liberia, that has to be a good thing, Johnny. You didn't answer that. Oh, I did, actually, but you weren't listening. Well, there is enough... Pe Come oh, on, social media. No, not, hang on. Not everybody's on social media. And how would they know to go looking for Liberian street children unless they saw Ed Sheeran with some? OK, so you're actually saying in 2017 it will take a supposed singer of merit... Oh, no, he's good. Hi, hi kids. Yeah, uh, those starving in Liberia. No, no, not buying it. Won't buy it. All right. It's a nonsense. All right. It's a nonsense. Let's see what others make of that. Thank you for that. James in, uh, James in Clapham, hello. Yeah, how are you, Sheila? What's going uh, on, James? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, as uh, far as I'm concerned, Sheila, sedition and treason was almost completed yesterday. And if it wasn't for Arlene Foster and the DUP, uh, the United Kingdom would have been given up yesterday by Theresa May and her traitorous advisers. And how many times do we have to do a deal with the Republic of Ireland over the six counties? We did, we did one in 1922. We did one in the Anglo-Irish Agreement. We've done on the Good Friday Agreement. Well, how many agreements do we have to, to be doing with, this, with, with the Republic? Northern Ireland is British, and it will stay British. 
uh, okay, I can I, I can hear your passion about this. I can hear where you're coming from on this. But sedition and treason on whose part? Uh, on the prime minister's part, Ari Foster was not advised of what was going on. How dare? Well, we don't know that. We don't know that. We don't know that. We know. We know. That no, we don't. Your your Claude Yoga was there ready to sign. The tea shop was there rubbing his hands together because he thought he had the six counties in the back back of his pocket and he would be re-elected again. No, Sheila. Treason and sedition or what happened yesterday. But, know, but, but even if... No, but, even, but James, even if that deal had gone ahead yesterday and even if the basis for that deal was Northern Ireland effectively staying in the customs union and the single market, even if those things were true, and David Davis has just told the Commons that it's not true, but we'll see, um, even if that was the case and that deal had gone ahead, that wouldn't have left the Republic of Ireland with the six counties in its back pocket. It would have left the Republic of Ireland with something that it very much wants, which is no hard border between the two and the Good Friday Agreement being maintained. It wants control, it wants control of the border. It wants control of goods in and out. It believes that uh, the Republic of well, Ireland... If it, no, 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 James, if it wanted no, that, no, if it wanted that, Ireland would have said, OK, tough, tough, we've got a hard border, we'll control that, thanks. But it didn't. It said we want a soft border. Speakedly. And by the way, the, the Good Friday Agreement had nothing to do with the European states. It was Warren Mitchell in the United States. So where was the EU when this was happening from the 60s onwards? Nowhere. Well, politics is a mobile creature, isn't they it? Not, they are not our friends, Sheila, because every time the Falklands War proved they were not our friends. They are not our friends. I want to leave everything. I voted to leave everything. I do not want to be betrayed. Right, James. Thank you, James, in Clapham. So any talk from Keir Starmer and others in the Commons today, including Anna Subri, actually, the Conservative MP, um, uh, the Europhile MP, uh, any suggestions from them that Theresa May should rethink her red lines, i.e. Uh, leaving the Customs Union, leaving the single market, leaving the European Court of Justice, um, it was rejected out of hand by David Davis. It's been rejected out of hand by James. You're listening to Sheila Fogarty on LBC. Um, we're about six, seven minutes away from the news at two, so there's time for a few more calls on Brexit and what's been going on in the Commons. A lot going on in the Commons today. There was that urgent question from the Brexit uh, Shadow Brexit Secretary, Keir Starmer, uh, over what the heck happened in Brussels yesterday about the Irish border. Paul, in York, hello. Oh, afternoon, Sheila. Afternoon. Um, well, collectively, they're a laughing stock. Um, I know you said all. Oh, you know, kind of, they're going to organise it. But politicians... I have no idea whether know, they will. I think it was a caller well, that said that. <laughs> well, well, can I give you my definition of a politician? Go on. Right. Politics meaning many and ticks as bloodsuckers. They, they, they are the most divisive, devious bunch I have ever heard. May I, Arlene Foster, I applaud Arlene Foster because she could be looking... A prime minister who is, is sympathetic to the IRA. She knows that to agree to all that would be detrimental to Northern Ireland. Now, from a principal point of view, when it gets difficult in the Falklands, do we let them go as well? Or Gibraltar? Where's the morals and principles of these so-called ministers? Does it bother you that Arlene Foster isn't... I mean, she's in coalition, she's the leader of a political party, so there's, the, the, there's of course, validity there, but she's not a member of Parliament. Well, <laughs> Angela Merkel's not a leader of uh, Germany at the moment. Isn't she? Well, no, she's not. She's, she hasn't got a government together. She's still a leader. Different system <laughs> there. Well, she is, whether you like it or not, Paul. She still is. Paul in York, thank you. John in Belfast, hi. Hello, uh, great to hear an Englishman's uh, view on Northern Ireland. There. <laughs> and Ireland Won't be the first water. time, John. <laughs> Good afternoon to you. A report into our terrorist response um, over recent years has found that there could have been an opportunity to prevent the Manchester Arena terror attack. David Anderson carried out this review and Amber Rudders reported back to the Commons in the last half hour, 45 minutes or so. That is the standout uh, statement really from uh, Amber Rudd's statement to the Commons and she also talked about um, a concerted effort 126 recommendations in this report and she's broken them down into themes she said, one being um, more wide sharing of information. Um, I've made the point that that was the lesson that was learned from the 2007 attacks the tube and bus bombings 
when uh, intelligence services didn't routinely tell police forces uh, when people were on the move and, and, and going backwards and forwards. That, that changed after uh, 2007 and 2010, as Lord Carlyle was pointing out as well. Uh, but it looks as though there needs to be a, a, a deeper approach to that, according to what Amber Rudd has just said. She talked about a shift in the threat um, uh, from Islamic State in particular, but from Islamism more generally. Steve has called from Aberdeen on this. Do you feel that the security services are doing the very best that they can, Steve? Um, yes, I definitely do think they are. And uh, why I'm phoning is um, whenever, I mean, Amber Rudd just made that statement and she's admitted that maybe something could have been done about the Manchester bombing. But the trouble with you, I mean, I'm actually quite an admirer of you generally, but people in the media, on the BBC and the ITV, whenever anything like this comes up, you immediately focus on the failings of the police and the security services and you brush under the carpet the fact that, I, I forget what she said, there were nine serious terrorist offences they actually stopped. I've said all of those things. I said that well, about two yeah, minutes what ago. What concentrating on is where the police and the security services are failing and you're failing to recognise that... There are hundreds, if not thousands, of Muslim terrorists in our country who want to kill people. And you keep blaming it on the security services as if it's their fault. It's not. They're, they're trying to stop it. It's all the hundreds and thousands of Muslim terrorists who are trying to kill us, and you're blaming the police for not stopping it. I mean, how, you'd, you'd have to have about five times as many people in the police and the security forces to stop everything, and you'll never get that. But you need to focus on what the problem is, and the problem is not the hard-working police and security services who are trying to save our lives from these thousands of terrorists who are trying to kill us. But you just don't look at that. And I look at the BBC <laughs> we look at it constantly. News. I've just got one more comment. I'll look at the BBC News tonight or ITV, and it'll be exactly the same. They'll be saying, what's wrong with the security services? What's wrong with the police? The problem is not the police or the security service, it's the terrorists. Okay, can I say something now? Can I say something well, now? You can, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I at least twice since since we began talking about this at two o'clock and beforehand when I uh, sort of reiterated what Amber, Amber Rudd had said, I referred to the nine successful um, uh, intervention stopping attacks. Um, and how many people do all you right, think would have Well, hang on, let me finish. Many more. Stopped. And and, we, and, yeah. and we've praised and applauded. I've said that as well in this well, last you? 20 minutes. I heard you well, you're not listening you're closely applauded. enough, Steve, because I absolutely... Well, have. Say it often enough well, most of what can I answer your points that you made now? Yeah. Because I reject all of them, except oh, for the one, okay. except for the one that says the Islamists or the white supremacists and Nazis. And yeah, all right, yeah, I'm just including yeah. it. I'm full of facts. That's all I'm telling you. Uh, they are to blame for the killings, of course. But what I'm discussing isn't blaming the police or the intelligence services for anything. Like well, you're hearing it differently and wrongly, Steve. What I am well, discussing... Is no, that. what I am discussing is what David Anderson has produced. David Anderson has not produced a report about the activities of Islamists. He's well, report... Well, 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 he hasn't, and I'm talking about his report. And his report is assessing our response to that threat. The police, the security services, the community, local authority. He is assessing that, so I am discussing that. That does not mean I'm pointing the finger of blame at the police or the commu or, or the or the it, security it, services. It sounds like you are, and I would imagine most of your listeners think the same thing. And when I listen to the news tonight, it'll be exactly the same. You're, look at the, you're not looking at the right problem. The problem is not the police and the security services. The problem is the terrorists. I know. And what David Anderson or someone else should be looking at is how you stop the terrorists and not make them do this or stop them coming into and the And you country. don't think that's happening? Well, it obviously isn't happening. It is happening. Well, they've stopped, well, they've stopped, well, they've stopped, they've stopped, they've stopped nine. nine. Already sold nine, and there's probably another 10 or 20 going on there that they don't know anything about. No, you sound like you're blaming the security services. I'm not. What I would like to see is I'd like to see a lot more general public volunteers helping the police and the security services out. In what way? Well, I don't, know how, I don't know how the security services track these people down, but, you know, we could be sitting by our computers or do, you know, 
have instructions from the security services. If you want to help us, you, you can do this on your computer. Instead of having, you know, 50 or 100 at GCHQ, they could have about 2 million people. Well, you should write and recommend that to them, see if they bite, Steve. Thank you for your call, Steve in Aberdeen. So, how has it come to this and what should happen next? Christine's in Woking. Hello, Christine. Hi, Ian. Hello. I've got to admit, I'm actually at 65 years of age. I am witnessing the death of democracy. And I actually feel sorry for Theresa May. I have been saying I think she's a very weak leader. But I, you do have to have some sympathy in terms of the total lack of support this poor woman is getting, even from within her own party, from the likes of Anna Soubry. And it's very interesting that the Northern Ireland issue has raised its ugly head since Tony Blair had his meeting with Juncker. So you've had Corbyn, Clegg, Blair, all out there having their little private meetings with him to undermine Theresa May's position, uh, to make a laughing stock of the, EU, e, the UK. And if the EU is such an amazing thing, why is it that so many of the uh, young people within those countries are leaving their homeland to come and work mainly in the UK and Germany? Well, because they can. It, because they can. But when the EU was first set up, um, I believe there were about eight countries. And when they discussed freedom of movement, never was it in, envisaged that it would be at the proportions it currently is. And it's totally undermining, um, well, countries like the, the UK because there's a, a limit to how somebody needs Sorry, to... Sorry, how, how is it undermining the UK to have European people come here to live and work? It's the sheer numbers of the people have no objection to them coming. It's the sheer numbers of them coming. And we keep being told... Do, what, what about the uh, 1.2 million British people who live in Europe as well? Yeah, exactly. They live within <laughs> Europe, not just within one country within no, Europe. No, but look, look at the proportions in Spain, for example. Um, you, you have, um, in proportion to the Spanish population, you have a higher concentration of Brits in Spain than you, do, you have EU nationals in Britain. And most of those have gone to retire there. Exactly. So they're of no use to the Spanish economy apart from the spending power. Pardon? They're of no use to the Spanish economy apart from their spending power, whereas at least yes. people who come here generally are working. Well, yes, and they're, they're doing all of the low-paid jobs, so that in itself means no, they're, they're, that they're not paying their taxes because they don't have to, because oh, they're on dear Chris, wages. Dear Christine, are, are, do, do, are you getting all of this from the Daily Mail every day? I, no, please. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, you're coming out with all of these statements. You say, well, all Eastern Europeans or all Europeans here are on low-paid jobs. It's just complete rubbish. Many, many of them are, and they all work cash in hand. So that's no, they the don't all work cash in hand. Christine, stop spreading these absolute lies. They do not all work cash in hand. There may, there may be some of them who do. There may be some British people who work cash in hand. Oh, well, it's, it's a terrible well. thing to do, to come on the radio and just basically insult a huge number of people like the way you're doing. Well, let's go back to Theresa May. I feel very sorry for the woman, and I think shame on all parties for not... Everyone keeps saying, like Sadiq Khan, oh, I respect the uh, results of the, um, the uh, referendum, but I still want to... Um, he doesn't want anything to change. He respects it, but he doesn't want it to have ever happened, and they're all feeling like that, and I think it's terribly sad for Theresa May that she's had to fight every single corner, and now with Northern Ireland coming into the equation, it's never going to happen. And my daughter's actually predicted that. Mum, it will never happen. Well, we will see. Christine, thank you. So let's go to Andy in Seaford. Hello, Andy. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think Arlene Phillips was right, what she did. I'll fed up with it. And the likes it's Arlene, Arlene Foster, not Arlene Phillips. Oh, I think I'd... <laughs> I think I do beg your pardon. I dread to think what Arlene Phillips thinks about this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the likes of Arlene Smith, you know, I'm, I'm not a very well-educated person. State school education. I'm 56 years old. I've given a lorry all over Europe. I voted to leave the European Union and all its institutions, including the single market, including the customs union, and it's the same as everybody else. I wasn't influenced by it. We could be like Norway or anything like that. I just want us out. I do not want to belong to a federal Europe. 
and, and it's about time they understood that. So what, when you have people like Carwin Jones saying, oh, people didn't vote to leave the single market or the customs union, poor, poor little uneducated people, they didn't know what they were voting for. What's your message to Carwin Jones? Yes, we did know what we were voting for. We want out. We do not want to belong to a federal Europe. We voted to leave the European Union and all its institutions. But, but he said it would be very, well, very let's, bad. Let us, let us, let's finish the analysis. Half my job is the invisible job, half, of actually planning for all outcomes, good to bad, or the whole range. Mm. Uh, and what we're doing at the moment is working that up. It'll take time. This is not the sort of thing you make up or write in a comment piece over a weekend. It is something you actually have to work out in great detail. And that's what we're doing right now um, I about this. I don't, you know, I don't, it's, in my job, I don't think out loud. I don't make guesses. Yeah? Those two things. I try to make decisions. You make those based on the data. That data is being gathered. We've got 50, nearly 60 sectoral analyses already done. We've got planning work going on the customs. We've got planning work going on 22 other issues which are critical, 127 all told. All of them have got to be grounded before we come to a conclusion what it looks like. So just to be clear, has the government undertaken any impact assessments on the implications of leaving the EU for different sectors of the Not in sectors, I think the, the economy. The, 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 what I'm, uh, what I, uh, what we do have, or not do have, the, the Treasury of course has got an ODR forecast which uh, has an implication, although even that's pretty crude, that's done from the um, from the, uh, uh, the average, I think, of all the external forecasts of effect, impact on the economy and so on. So uh, there's nothing, there's, there's, no, there's no sort of systematic uh, uh, impact assessment. So the, the answer to the question no. is no. Yeah. So the government hasn't undertaken any impact assessments yeah. on the implications for leaving, of leaving the EU for different sectors of the British economy. Mm. Um, so there isn't one, for example, on the automotive sector? On the automotive no, sector? No, not I'm aware of, no. Is there one on aerospace? Not I'm aware of, no. no. One on financial services? Well, I think the answer's going to be no to all of them. No to all of them, <laughs> right. <laughs> now, doesn't it strike you, Secretary of State, as rather strange, given experience around the committee in which you have, the government undertakes impact assessments on all sorts of things all of the time, mm. that on the most fundamental change? that we are facing as a country, yeah. you've just told us that the government hasn't undertaken any impact assessments at all looking at the impact on individual yeah. sectors of Let's, the economy. I'm just reading some uh, copy uh, from a journalist who was observing David Davis this morning um, in that uh, Brexit Scrutiny Committee meeting, making a, a frank assessment that um, they didn't exist um, certainly that no impact assessments have been completed, he said, in front of this uh, committee. Now, the, the parliamentary committees are deemed to be parliament, by the way, just to be clear. Um, it, that will inevitably lead to suggestions that the, the May team just haven't done their, their background work, their spade work, as it's described here. His second uh, suggestion, that he didn't have resources to do this, or the government doesn't have resources for this, and that some of the work his officials had done uh, wasn't very captivating, wasn't very good, uh, doesn't exactly provide a ringing endorsement of, of the department, does it, the Brexit department. And then he revealed that he'd only read two chapters um, of the 850 pages of analysis, or he'd been given two chapters, apologies, of the 850 pages of analysis, but hadn't read them. Deary, deary me, Carl in Portsmouth. Uh, are we getting a bit too relaxed about politicians that duck and dive, to put it politely? Well, I think, to be fair, um, I think there needs to be a bit of honesty here and a little bit of reality. This is a trick and there's a trap that's been set by people who voted Remain in Brexit and it's been set up for a long time. Um, what happened was is that Remain has got very upset that a government, say the Conservatives, decided to go through with Brexit. They were hoping that government would stop it. But when the Conservatives went through with it, they've now tried to attack the Conservatives endlessly. So I asked the Conservatives, have you done an assessment report? The Conservatives say, yes, we have. And then the Remainers say, well, can we see it? And of course, the government can't show this report because it is going to dictate their negotiation, um, negotiation position in so, Brexit. So, 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 all right. So you believe that, that intense, detailed assessment of the impact of Brexit on the various sectors of our economy have indeed been carried out? I believe that you... Can I put it another way? No, but do you believe that? Do you believe that? 
No, but let me put it another way. Whoever is demanding that these reports be shown and given the light of day deserve to be lied to because they are just playing games to stop Brexit. They are the Brexit Scrutiny Committee in Parliament. Yes, led by um, Ben, uh, is it, sorry. Hillary Ben. Hillary Ben, who's an arch Remainer. It doesn't, and it doesn't matter who the people are that making of this up. The game is obvious. For it's a cross-party committee of Parliament and you're saying it deserves to be lied to. Well, let me put this... There, in there are representatives in Parliament, no, Carl. No, no, no. No, they're, you're, no, they're playing a game on your behalf, not my behalf. David Davis is playing a game on my behalf because he's saying to you lot, stop interfering and trying to stop Brexit. Yes. You know we can't show you the report, so stop asking for it. And that's exactly why you're asking for it. Gosh. You talk about government... Now, hang on. You talk about parliamentary sovereignty, yeah? And the government has been elected. They've done a report that they're allowed to go through, and you're saying that you now have authority and everyone else has authority to tell them what to do. But what about government sovereignty? I mean, you but, can't have it but but, 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 parliamentary committees don't have to tell me everything or you everything or any journalist everything. If something is sufficiently sensitive, that's what committees are for. They sometimes take evidence from fellow MPs and ministers right. and they don't right. always initially share it for, for the reasons you've outlined but you seem very relaxed Carl too relaxed for my liking well hang on you seem very relaxed about the idea that politicians just don't tell the truth no no no, you, no that is a big misunderstanding your politicians on your side are playing a game my politicians on my side are countering your game it is not about truth <laughs> you are making a big conflation. But no, but don't you but don't you think, Carl, that it's don't you think it's wrong and dangerous that you and I, two citizens of the United Kingdom, right. can look at our government and parliamentary committees voted in people that we've voted in, parliamentary committees, looking at and we don't know for sure when David Davis opens his mouth, we don't know whether he's telling a lie on your behalf, because he doesn't think dreadful Remainers like Sheila Fogarty and others should should have any detail on the impact of Brexit, or he's telling a lie on my behalf. Well, ask yourself this question. If he released the report as you asked him, what would No, happen? but we're st no, hang on, hang on. We're not talking about release. No, we're not talking about release yet. We're talking about the very existence of them. He has yes. said they exist, and then he said they don't. Yes, but the problem is, is he might well say that they exist when you initially asked them to be shown to the public, and now this has gone into some backroom negotiations into the depths of Parliament. Fine, but the original problem was... It's not backroom. It's recorded by journalists. Committee hearings. Do a poll with yourself and your callers coming in. Which ones are Brexit and they don't, are perfectly happy with this and which one is Remainers? I guarantee you, all the people that are upset with this were people who voted Remain. So you, there should be the answer. So, but, but, but what I'm hearing from you, Carl, is that you're comfortable for, for politicians to lie. No, because I, dis I dispute the premise of which you're calling a lie. It is not a lie. We are just playing games here. Everyone is lying. You know it's a lie to say, show me the results, because you know they can't do that. So in a way, you're being utterly dishonest. Show me the results is a request, not a statement. Well, no, but that's what you guys in, in the Remain camp have been saying. All this but, time. but the whole of Parliament said it. The whole of Parliament on November the 1st said, yes, please, we'd like those Brexit impact assessment statements. And the minister said, yeah, yeah they're coming. And then they returned to Parliament and said, whoopsie, can we have another week? And everyone went, oh, I wonder yeah. why. I thought they'd already been done. And now we hear today that they haven't been done at all. No, you're making too many conflations there, I'm afraid, Sheila. You, Parliament did not demand that these were brought out. It was Remain voting MPs and Lords who have pushed it through. So I wish you would be a little bit more precise. On November the... Well, I'll be precise for you. On November the 1st, MPs passed a motion to release Brexit impact assessments to the Brexit Committee of MPs. Now we've been told today right. but by David Davis that there aren't any. Right, but before that all happened, you were asking David Davis, have you done an assessment package? And of course, David Davis had to say yes, because if he said no, then Remainers would have said, oh my God, no one's running the country, this has all got to stop. You are just trying to do everything, you anything. Well, he's just said we haven't done any. Why didn't he say it then, when he was busy allowing a motion to be passed in Parliament? Never mind programmes like this. In Parliament, a motion was passed by MPs to release the Brexit impact assessments. That Surely that was the point to say there aren't any. 
But what about the fact that we don't know if there is or isn't, and it doesn't really matter anyway, because when we come down to the final part of this, <laughs> hang on, the final part of this is, the final part of this, even if there was an assessment report and it didn't say good things, it said everyone was going to die in six years' time, we'd still be leaving because that's what we voted for. So it doesn't matter what the input says, it doesn't matter what games the MPs are playing, but it really does matter. Seriously, if Brexit thought, thought we'd all be dead in six years, you'd still think we should stick with it, Carl? It's just a joke. It's not Well, it's not funny. It's just not funny, Carl. Nor is how relaxed you are about politicians lying. 0345 6060 973, the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. David Davis is just toying with a few remainers here and there, says Carl. So maybe we'll examine that suggestion. The impact assessments must exist because uh, David Davis's department confirmed that they did and he spoke about them himself. So why now pretend that they don't? Oh, or just sort of um, lend me your rose-tinted spectacles, because God knows I need them. Kevin is in Grimsby. Ah, Grimsby. Kevin, what would you like to say? How are you, James? Very good, Kevin. How are you? Oh, James. This, oh, Kevin. When you talk about Brexit, it brings all the Christmas cheer out and all the Ramoners, doesn't it? Um, I voted... But everybody I voted. rational is, is going to be a little bit worried about David Davis saying that these <clears throat> analyses were really, really important and that there were 58 of them and that he can't really do his job until they've all been completed and then saying three months later that they never existed at all and he doesn't need anything like that. That's not a Ramona. You know what? He's, he probably, he's probably sat and thought, you know, I wish I'd have just kept my mouth shut and basically uh, not even mentioned about these impact statements. Right. I voted to leave, right? And I voted to leave for as one of the normal guys on the street. Yes. When I ticked that box, get out of the EU, I ticked, I don't want to be paying any more money. I'm sick and tired of the immigration issue that we've got. There's not, the, the, being a member of the EU benefits me not. You know, I came on after the commercial break and one of the commercials... You're not really I allowed to talk about the adverts on, 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 on the radio. There's rules, there's rules about it. I don't know whether you're going to say anything that would break those rules, but I'd rather not risk it if it's all right with you. Society, we've got a problem where we're struggling to look after our own people. And when we were a member of the EU, we, we, had, we still have this problem. Being out of the EU, we're still going to have this problem. So, as far as I'm concerned, David Davis is not the man to get there. But then again... To get where, Kevin? Sorry? To get where? He's not the man to get there, you said. To get where? He's not the man to do any negotiations or anything. But from the layman's terms, from my perspective, I'm only interested in two things. Get that letter handed over to say we're getting out, which was perfect, that was done. And now we've got, oh, we need to negotiate this, we need to negotiate that. No, we don't. The figures for the, the, that were just released in the, the car industry, car sales were down. We're still in the EU. They're down. They're going to still be down when we leave the EU. Nothing's going to change. And then they'll go back up. Things do you read the Grimsby down. Evening... Do you read the Grimsby Telegraph? Well, do you know what? If I'm having a really happy day, I'll read it to get depressed. Did, did you... Well, that's, that's what the news does to, to sensible people, so don't feel bad about that. Did you see the report about the delegation from the Lincolnshire food industry going to Westminster. Right. No, I never, but my wife probably does because she's... This, was, this was where they called upon the government to provide Grimsby with exemptions from Brexit. The, the seafood, oh, yeah, seafood yeah, should yeah. be given a special free trade status to, to ensure that the, the town's not damaged. And, and some, some of the detail in it... it was cause companies like Young's and Icelandic Sea Chill, the biggest employers in Grimsby, um, they import yeah. 90% of the fish they process, yeah. which would automatically become subject to tariffs if we don't get our finger out quickly. They, they predicted a 20% labour shortfall um, as a result of Brexit. Th these are the people running the seafood industry in your hometown. Uh, they talked the about time, right? the delays in fresh fish, fresh fish reaching the town's factories, import fees. Um, chap called Simon Dwyer, who speaks for the Seafood Grimsby and Humber cluster group representing the industry, biggest employer in yep. your town, of course, called on the government to look at bestowing free trade status on the ports of Immingham and Grimsby itself in relation to seafood. Um, because, of course, customs checks and import tariffs on seafood coming yep. in or out of those ports yep. would, in the words of the, the, the people that run the industry, um, possibly destroy it. Well, you know, this is where good management comes in when you run a business, because I run they, a business. They do run it. When you're affected by things... They do run it. 
Yeah, no, but... They run the fishing industry in your hometown and they're describing Brexit as something they desperately need to be excused from. I understand that, but what happens is, what will happen is, if it, if it is affected, when things take place, they'll sit around a table and they will figure a way around it. Okay. I mean, but as far as I'm concerned, in the normal... You mean like David Davis is doing at the moment? David, like, the, the people in the government couldn't run a pub, let alone run the government. But from a... But the people in the industry who say, please, please don't do this, do this, they, they should be the ones who are forced to do it. Like... That's where you've got your foreign against, and that's where... No, no, that's that's the fishing industry in your hometown. I know nothing about fishing. I, I, I discovered that 90% of the fish that comes into your hometown is imported from the European Union. I didn't know that. You probably didn't either. So the people that run the biggest employers in your hometown are saying, please don't make us do this. And you and you say, it's all right, they'll all sit around a table. Police ops, and I used to see the lorries coming in delivering the fish from Aberdeen, you know, down to the docks. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't there. It's not just. How does that address what the fellas who run Youngs and 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 Sea Chill have said? The fact that you used to see some lorries in Cleethorpes, Kevin. Say that no lorries from Scotland delivering C- fish. Come when you lived in Cleethorpes. I, I don't. I mean that that would presumably be the ten percent that's not imported, wouldn't it? No. Well, you know what? There'll all, there'll always be fish coming in. They'll resolve it. But what I'm trying to say to you is. From the the guy on the street's perspective, the guy on the street works I'm, I'm for these companies, Kevin. The guy on the street works for these companies whose bosses are saying Brexit saying, is going to be a disaster for your hometown. I totally understand what you're saying, but see the guy in the street that voted Leave. He's no interested in that issue. Well, whether he's got but a job or not next year. Affects us, right? And it, what affects but it's his us, employer describing the possibility of going out of business. How can that not affect him? Well, do you know what? Maybe the government can put some of that money in uh, to the fishing industry. But we've just established that you think the government is a, you think the government is unfit for purpose, Kevin. That was your own observation at the beginning of this call. The, the people that are, uh, are running the government are unfit for purpose. I think. But you want them to come to the rescue? You just said. No, I don't. No, I don't want them people to come to the rescue. What I'm saying is, the 50 million that they were paying into the EU, I'm sure they can divert some of that cash into help the fishing industry. Well, no, they can't because they've got to settle our bills with the European Union. Otherwise, on the yeah, world stage, the our ability to to strike trade deals, we, we'll look like shirkers. We'll look pay, like con men. You don't, need, you don't need to pay money to get a, a trade deal. You do that with discussing on a table. That's can can you money. can you name one trade deal on the planet that doesn't involve finances? Cars. Pardon. Cars, vehicles. What, what do you mean? The vehicles. That I, I mean, said, name a trade deal. So you need yeah, to say the, something like NAFTA, I'm or you need to say something like SECA. I'm giving, I'm giving you a trade. The car industry. The cars that are made in this country, we buy some of the parts from the EU, and part of the tariff EU tariff free at, at the moment. Tariff free because yeah, well, we're in a know, trade deal. Free, you know, if, if they decide we're going to put a tariff on, and, then we'll just put one back. Oh, you know, mate, and it mate, do you know why? We've got a tariff-free trade with the European Union. Yeah, because we pay fifty million a day to be in that in the, in the club. We pay fifty we million pounds a day to be in the club. Yeah, we don't we, we don't get it for free. Oh, I can't. I don't, I, I, let's let's just shake hands and, and say goodbye, Kev. Are you know aware that we pay money to be in this club, and that's yes, why we get. That's the why it's a trade agreement. Trade. You, you're supposed to be telling me about the trade agreements that you don't have to pay to be in, Kevin, and you've just Look, described one that you do I'm have to, to talk pay. From the layman, like, I'm trying to talk from the young, the person on the street, right? Whose boss has said Brexit well, could close our business in so, Grimsby. Let me put it this way. When we're in the EU, your pay packet doesn't change. See, when we're at the EU... Mate, it's already gone down by 15%, your pay packet, since we voted to leave. Mine's, hasn't it? My business has increased. You're not paid in pounds? Yes, I'm paid in pounds. And that that pound is worth 15% less than it was before the vote. And and most of the economic modelling is... The pound was going down against the euro. uh, And the dollar. And every currency on the planet. Seven years ago, because I was doing business in Spain seven years ago. And it went from 125 down to 117, and it's been down ever since. And that was way before we decided to have a referendum. Yes. Currencies fluctuate all the time, but there's not a single person in the world who doesn't credit the collapse in the pound after Brexit to the referendum result. Except perhaps you, my friend. It's not a 100% responsible thing because of it. Okay. Okay. So anyway, just just to clarify, the trade deal that doesn't involve paying, can you just run me by what that looks like, where it is? What do you mean the trade, what do you mean the trade deal? The one, the one, the one that you were talking about a minute ago when you said you can well, have lots of trade agreements we without EU? paying membership fees. How, how, how did it work before we were in the EU? Did it not work then? Did, did, I mean, people could still do trade, Kevin, but they had tariffs. 
And they had to, um, mate, I, I, let, let's just leave we're it, shall we? We're in the 21st no. century, James. Pardon? We're in, we're in the 21st century. Well listen, done, Kevin. I, Finally, something we can agree on. Right, listen. See, I am listening, we, we, Kevin. Listen, what I'm trying to say is that the guy on the street that voted leave, which was me, yeah. right? The reason that I voted leave wasn't it because of trade deals, wasn't it because of, y y you know, how much money we, we think we might get out of it or whatever? There's only a couple of reasons I voted leave. One, we're paying all this money into the EU, and the guy on the street that's in austerity benefits not, right? He's got a job. Well, we're sick of it, right? And the biggest I'm employer in Grimsby has said that job is now under threat. Well, do you know what? So you, you're telling me, with, this is quite patronising, my friend, you're telling me that the ordinary man on the street in Grimsby deliberately voted to endanger his own livelihood? No, sir. But listen, you're talking... What about all the self-employed people and all this, the other... Why are you million? talking about them now? It's almost well, as if every time you say something, I respond to it and you move on to something else. What was reason two, Kevin? Because re reason one has boiled down to the ordinary man on the street in Grimsby. Let me give, let me give you another example. No, just I give me reason two, two Kevin. A job in the I know a girl that's just got a job in the hospital. She gave up a career she had in care. She went to work in the hospital. Three weeks later, she was told, by the way, 70 years of are in here. We only need two of you now because Virgin Health have decided that they're, that they're taking over and they want rid of you. She now needs to lose her job. Where's the EU help there? You got me, mate. That's it. That's a brilliant reason to vote to leave the European Union. No, I'm giving you my personal reason. I know, and I'm, I'm saying it's my a brilliant personal, personal reason. reason. I'm sick of the immigration issues. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of 50 million a day in this club that's corrupt. Yes, oh, that's fine. I've got no, I've got no beef with you. I just, I just, I think you should say thank you to me for making you aware of what the biggest employers in your hometown say about it all. Well, great. I'll, do you know what? Just a nice, just a simple thank you, and then we can have the news headlines. Well, um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't affect me as far as Young's is concerned. Okay, and but but you are in Grimsby, and it is the seafood industry, and most people see a link between the two. But hey, you keep talking to the ordinary man in the street who lives in Grimsby but doesn't care about the seafood industry. Fish.